Hello, and welcome to CSAP's Science and Policy podcast. I'm Rob Doubleday, and this series on science advice and government is produced together with Expertise Under Pressure, which is a research project of the Centre for Humanities and Social Change at the University of Cambridge. This spring, we're looking forward to the announcement of an inquiry into government's handling of the COVID pandemic. And we certainly hope that that inquiry will consider the government's use of science and evidence and the communication of that science and evidence to the public in order to promote public health. And we certainly hope that this inquiry will lead to learning, reflection, and if possible, you know, positive change. In this episode, we're going to look back a few decades to another public health crisis that the UK confronted, and that was mad cow disease, or BSE. In particular, what sort of lessons were drawn from an assessment of what went on? The the very short introduction to the BSE crisis in the UK was that a, a new disease was discovered in cattle in the 1980s. It raised some concern. Scientists looked at the question, didn't think there was likely to be a significant risk of its transmission to humans. But then in the late 80s and early 90s, increased prevalence of of a disease in humans was detected, a new variant CJD, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And there was concern that this uh, may have been caused by eating contaminated beef. The government of the day was very keen to try and both manage public health, but protect the farming industry and spent quite a lot of capital reassuring consumers that the risk was either non-existent or very small. Until in March 1996, the health secretary had to stand up in the House of Commons and actually concede that consuming contaminated beef was causing this new and very scary disease in humans. And at that point, the number of people infected the likely course of the disease, how many people would die was entirely unknown. And it was extremely scary at the time and shocked confidence in government and its use of science and its protection of the public. So that's the the situation in 1996. And then the question was, what should be done and what lessons should be learned? So that's what we're going to talk about now and how that led to the establishment of a new way of governing food safety and food risk at the establishment of the Food Standards Agency. And I'm very pleased that we're joined today by Dame Julia Unwin, whose career inc- included a number of leading roles in the voluntary sector. And then in 2001, she was appointed to the National Consumer Council. And in 2003, uh, was appointed as deputy chair of the then very young Food Standards Agency. Julia's role there really to co-lead the agency and develop its relationship with both government, with regulator, you know, its role as a regulator, and importantly, with the public. We're also joined by Professor Eric Millstone, who I know very well, who is a professor at the University of Sussex in SPRU, the Science Policy Research Unit there, um, whose research for as long as I've been alive has focused on the use of science and evidence in the governance of food, and particularly food safety and food risk. Eric, I know, followed the establishment of the Food Science Agency closely. To start the story, perhaps in early 1997, when the Labour Party was considering the prospect of winning the general election that was going to happen in May 1997, uh, commissioned a professor in Scotland, Professor Philip James, who ran the Rowett Institute in Aberdeen, nutrition and food science, to consider what sort of regulatory reforms should be made in order to respond to the kinds of challenges that the BSC crisis had posed. Eric, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about who who Philip James was and what he then produced in that short number of months uh, between March and May 1997. Philip James was a specialist in nutrition, nutrition policy, and the Rowett Institute that he ran in the University of Aberdeen was specifically focused in large part, on on nutrition. And Philip had previously been a chair of an expert advisory committee on nutrition policy for the previous government, although that committee had been shut down for giving advice that the government didn't want to receive. So the leadership of the Labour Party deemed him a suitable person to advise on the possible creation of a food stamp agency. And I got involved in the process for a couple of reasons. One was that I was the co- a co-author of the first document, the first report, recommending the 
establishment of the Food Standards Agency, but also because I published a review of the structure and operation of a range of different food regulatory advisory bodies across um, multiple jurisdictions, and therefore had some ideas about how such an agency or organisation could be structured and how it could operate. Eric, I mean, it'd be interesting to know, you know, how, how, how did the, the process then work? So one, once Philip James was commissioned by the Labour Party, he had a very short period of time. I mean, what was produced? Well, on the day that Tony Blair came into office, Phil James delivered to him a report uh, recommending the creation of the Food Standards Agency and describing a possible arrangement for it. And then as... Blair appointed his senior ministers, he invited Jack Cunningham into his office in number 10 to be Secretary of State at the Ministry of Ag, Fish and Food. And my understanding is Blair handed a copy of the James report to Jack Cunningham and said, implement it. And and Cunningham and the Ministry of Ag, Fish and Food then set about doing so. The position had been, well, and was during preceding 40 years, really, that the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food was supposed simultaneously to promote the commercial interests of the agricultural industry and the food industry, while also supposedly protecting consumers. And the widespread perception, particularly because of the BSE crisis, but a, 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 several other food safety um, scandals that erupted in the 80s and early 90s, was that there was a contradiction at the core of the remit of the Minivag Fresh and Food that supposedly trying simultaneously to look after the competing interests of producers and consumers led to an irreconcilable tension, the net result of which I think was that the Minivag Fish and Food actually let down all its constituencies. And James's pivotal proposal was to take responsibility for regulation of food safety away from the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, allocate it to the Food Standards Agency, which would then be answerable to the Department of Health and not to, the, not to Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. And so, so that was the sort of core recommendation of the James report. Does, does that make sense so in, in terms of your understanding, your scholarship on, on government's use of science in, in the food system, Eric? And, you know, are there other elements, are there other lessons that you think were, were learned and during that period of reflection on obviously what was a, was a massive crisis in the kind of confidence and operation of the regulatory system that BSE Yes, I think you've uh, characterised it correctly then, Robert, because the crisis that erupted in late March 1996 wasn't simply a crisis about the safety of British beef, but about the competency of the food safety regulatory system as a whole. There were other lessons that drive one. One argument was it was necessary to separate science from policy making, but also separate advice from policy decision making. While quite a few of the lessons were initially learnt, so several of them were quite quickly forgot. So that in the James report, the James report recommended that the Food Standards Agency should be set up as what is called a non-departmental public body, which would be an arm's length body that would advise ministers and ministers would decide. And that recommendation was reproduced in the white paper that came out from the Ministry of Ag, Fish and Food, proposing the creation of a food standards agency. But between the white paper and the legislation that subsequently established the food standards agency, the agency mutated from a non-departmental public body into a non-ministerial departmental body. So it became a government department without a minister. And I think the implication of this was clear. Can we clear just a little detail, historical detail about what happened when 
the first chair of the Food Standards Agency was appointed. First chair from the publishing of the white paper to the to the actual establishment of the Food Standards Agency. When when was the Food Standards Agency actually established? The Food Standards Agency became operational on the first of April two thousand. But instead of the agency advising and ministers deciding, the board of the agency was designated as the policy making body. And to that extent, ministers were, I think, trying to establish the agency, not to adjust to protect public health and food safety, but to protect ministers from having to take responsibility for difficult decisions. Well, that, Eric, thank you so much for that sort of tour of the analysis that, that of Philip James and yourself on you know, some of the ways that the governance of the food system could learn from the crisis of, of, of BSC and restore public confidence in, in the food system. And you, you talked about that separation of the role of the government department responsible for looking after the producer and the consumer. You talked about separating out the science from the policy in the process of and that's pr- probably particularly important where there's lots of uncertainty, there's con- contestation in the scientific community about exactly what's going on. And yet, of course, decisions need to be made. And then you drew then the distinction between advice and decision making. I'd like to now turn to Julia. You know, And so you, in 2003, were brought in as the deputy chair, deputy to John Krebs, who we've heard, heard about just now. And Obviously, as we said, the sort of the consumer and public confidence was at the heart of the Food Standards Agency and, and its reason for existing. And you'd come fr- from the National Consumer Council. So presumably part of your role was to think about how the agency and to, to help the agency operate as, you know, an agency of and for consumers. Is that is that a fair characterization? I think it was always positioned as a balance between voices that could understand and interrogate the science, not specialist scientists, but those who had, were scientifically literate, and those who were connected to consumer interests. Um, but I think we mustn't understate what a crisis there was about food at this stage. I think in the run-up to the establishment of the Food Standards Agency, the Labour government had quite properly, the Labour opposition, in those days quite properly recognised that the loss of public trust in the integrity and safety of our food was what I think we would now call beginning to be a moral panic because yes BSC was major and catastrophic but if you remember we'd lost a health minister because of salmonella and eggs it was the beginning of large-scale agribusiness and a feeling in the public's mind that this was all out of control. Now some of that came up with rather left field positions and the development of you know big promotions of organic food and so on and so forth, fueled it. But I think there was a real worry about the level of public trust in the safety of food. And that was had been one of the many things that had made the last days of the major government so difficult and so painful, and as I say, lost ministers over it. The James report was welcomed hugely, and I think it was an intelligent thing for the then opposition to do. My own feeling is rather different from Eric's. I was delighted it became a non-ministerial government department because in my experience, that allowed freedom from politicians. And I think one of the big bits of evidence we had then that public trust was damaged both by a sense that ministers were controlling this in their own political interests and the food industry was controlling it in their interests. So from my point of view, my welcome to this was that this was going to be a body that would operate openly and transparently, make its decisions in public, and I'm pleased to see it still does, although I wasn't aware of that, putting the evidence out there, um, led by a scientist, but not a food scientist, not somebody with that background, but someone with a deep and abiding interest in risk and risk communication. And what I'd observed in the first few years of the Food Standards Agency was a strong board of multiple interests, able to interrogate the science, hold it to account in the public interest, interrogate the stakeholders, hold it to account in the public interest, and make some of the fiendishly difficult decisions that ministers might, because of all the other pressures on them, duck. And most importantly, establish its distance from the food industry. And I think that was extraordinarily important in the early days of the FSA. How did you think? So, so we've we've emphasised the crisis of public trust, and that the Food Standards Agency has kind of understood itself as really a response to that, and trying to restore public trust and confidence in the food system. How did you know in those 
relatively early days of the Food Standards Agency, how did the FSA think about public trust and confidence? Was it something that you went out and measured and monitored? How did you sort of get a handle on whether what you were doing was working or not? Well, we did invest very heavily in risk communication and therefore inevitably in the measurement and metrics about public trust and public views. And I was very struck then, um, and I'm more skeptical now, but I was very struck then by the very open nature of the Food Standards Agency, the fact that all papers are available, the fact that discussions were you know, available online and in person, and we had serious discussions in public, the extent to which that did drive improvements in public health. Now, in public trust, forgive me, in public trust. Now, I can, of course, see there were lots of other drivers going on too. The food industry itself was investing very heavily in that. Um, but I think something about a new agency operating in a different way did have measurable impacts on the way in which public felt about food safety. I think there were other complications, though, because we were set up with the title of the Food Standards Agency with a staff that was largely concerned with food safety. And one of the very early difficult issues they felt faced before my time was about what was quite often called colloquially the yuck factor. You know, what did you do about food, chicken stored in chlorine, for example, for which the public would generally express distaste? but no food safety issues were identified. And that was quite a fault line within the agency. Eric's shaking his head. Maybe I've got that wrong. Yeah, do, do jump in, Eric. OK. Um, <laughs> I'm interested that Julia's view is that it, it, it's good that it was set up as a non-ministerial departmental body. But it seems to me that we, the public, the electorate, elects government, and ministers are paid to take responsibility for difficult decisions. And offshoring responsibility for these decisions to the agency served to protect ministers from having to take responsibility for it. Now, ministers are directly accountable to parliament and their electorate can deprive them of their seats. But there, there were problems with I think of the lack of accountability, direct accountability of the Food Standards Agency. Now, what it says in yeah. terms of openness is entirely correct. Policy decisions were taken by the board in open meetings on the basis of published documents that were publicly available, and one could pu publicly attend and still can FSA board meetings, and they're now you know, you can follow them on, on live on. On, on stream, but there are not the same kinds of direct mechanisms of accountability yeah. of the board that there are for ministers who can be obliged routinely to get up on their hind legs and answer challenging questions in Parliament. Yeah, that's very, th thank you, Eric. I mean, that is a, a good point. I mean, it's both, I think both you're pointing out that openness of the FSA to which, which doesn't seem so odd or surprising now, but you know, in in the context of sort of the way Britain was governed in the nine, you know, historically, you know, in in the year two thousand, this was a change, wasn't it? So there is that form of accountability, but of course, Eric's right that being non ministerial, this it, it lacks that sort of direct relationship to Parliament. Did that ever, in your time, Julia, come up as as an issue that? that was felt as, as a sort of a problem in terms of the FSA's legitimacy in, 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 when, when you were there? Oh, repeatedly. And I think ministers were quite angry, anxious, vexed about the openness with which we did things. And there were constant, complex negotiations, both with ministers and with other officials, like the chief medical officer, obviously, the chief vet. Now, this was not straightforward and linear in the way that publicity can suggest. I'm intrigued by it. I mean, the Bank of England, the Charity Commission where I'd served were also non-ministerial public bodies, established because it was felt that the political cut and thrust was allowing for too many short-term decisions for the Charity Commission since the 17th century, but others more recently, um, and that it was important for public confidence, as in the Bank of England, that it wasn't de dealt with by short-term political expedience. I look back on it and think, yes, I can see exactly why those judgments were made in both directions, and I'm sure Eric and I could talk for hours about the constitutional implications. What I'm interested in is to what extent did we get better at communicating the complexity of risk? Because food safety is not binary, it's not safe or it's not safe, there are always shades of grey in that, um, and which is why I referred to the issue of public acceptability of some things to do with food, which may not 
speak directly to safety. So I think we were able to tread that path, but I think it's a very fine judgment and I certainly wouldn't die in a ditch. One way is the right way to do it. What I do think mattered was the separation from business and industry. And one way of signalling it was by signalling our separation from these two great stakeholders. I mean, that's a very important point, which we can kind of interrogate that separation from industry. And of course, then that relationship with with ministers and government comes in again. But I wonder if if there are any sort of specific examples that we can illustrate some of these dynamics with, um, you know, were there specific cases, Julia, that you recall from your time when you know, that that effort to work with the science and the public and the communication was sort of worked well or where there were tensions that, that were kind of difficult to deal with? Well, while I was the acting chair, because Professor Krebs left in my final year, so I took over, there was the issue of Sudan Red, and I don't know what Eric's views were about that. But there was the beginning of some quite worrying data and some scientific advice that we received about the impact of certain flavorings um, in food and we had to make a decision about it and how public we would be about it. Um, We were denounced by the Prime Minister of the day for being alarmist and chasing food off the shelves. We were in serious trouble with some bits of the food industry and to this day I don't know if it was the right thing to do but I do know that a group of people with the public interest at heart interrogated a lot of scientific evidence, received Um, different views, because of course there are different views on any of these issues, looked at a multiplicity of ranges of data and took the decision that we needed to communicate that there was some risk in some of this food and we had to watch the share price be affected by it. And believe me, we could be lobbied in ways that were quite uncomfortable, quite properly (laughs) uncomfortable and challenging by both ministers and by um, the industry. What do you think were the conditions that that enabled the FSA to take a line that was kind of at odds, basically, with the prime minister of the day? I mean, it must have been an uncomfortable position, but why did you feel you were able to do that? Because the overwhelming weight of the scientific evidence presented from a range of different disciplines, different scientists, under a form of scientific governance in which I had confidence, made those recommendations. I didn't do it on my own. Nobody can make those sort of decisions on their own. But we consulted, we had, we were very clear that the views of stakeholders were different from the views of producers, were different from the views of scientists, and that those all needed to be taken into account. And to this day, I'm not sure if it was right or wrong, but I absolutely clear that a group of people who thought it through very seriously at that stage thought this was the right advice to give to the public. I agree that one of the great virtues of the Food Standards Agency was that it did and still does make lots of policy decisions in public, though to my certain knowledge from my sources in the FSA, actually (laughs) quite a few decisions are not made in public. Be that as it may, I think there's also, over time, been a serious problem about the extent to which the the food industry has been able to exert influence in the Food Standards Agency. I think when uh, John Krebs was chair and Julia was was deputy chair, the, the food industry lobbied the FSA strongly, but was not intimately involved in making decisions. My argument always was that food industry representatives should not be members of the FSA board or, or and its consultants should not be members of expert advisory committees. But what the white paper said and what ministers repeatedly said in parliament as the legislation was going through is oh we want some food industry representatives there because of the information that they have and their understanding but they will always remain in a minority well on the point about the information and their understanding they don't need to be on the decision making board in order to provide information but while when the food standards agency was set up food industry representatives were present on the board in 2000, but were in a minority. Yes, because that's what that's what the minister said. They'll be there, but they'll always be in a minority. What sort of more direct lessons do we learn from BSC, from the establishment and, and development of the FSA with the sorts of challenges, you know, that we've seen our government and governments around the world have to grapple with where there's a very swiftly changing kind of dynamic with the infectious disease, where there's developing science, 
and need to, to make quite drastic policy decisions, you know, how are those risks communicated? How, how does the government stand as a sort of trusted source that the public look to? And, and, and what can we learn, Julia, from the recent past? Well, I think what we learned through BSE and then through a number of the other food scares is a lot about how you communicate risk. Because we had a body of evidence about sharing uncertainty, enabling people to make different sorts of decisions. I remember speaking at a press conference about you know, the amount of fish people should be eating. Hugely contested, very difficult for women who are about to have babies, all of that stuff. We learned a way of communicating uncertainty and important information. So the old FSA model of having scientific advice and stakeholder advice and hearing them both, but recognizing that both were partial, seems to me to have been lost in the flurry of either we follow the data blindly when clearly the data doesn't take you to any particular place. Uh, We follow the science being said as if science was an absolute and always linear. and an inability to say that, of course, ministers are making tricky decisions that trade things off. Of course, there is always risk. There is nothing in life that is risk free. Um, we have to find a way of managing it. The only other thing I'd say is one of the other distinctive features of the FSA has always been that it was not a reserved matter for Whitehall and Westminster. It was a devolved matter. And so therefore, I think one of the things the Food Standards Agency, and again, in its early days, and I'm not in touch now, was very clear about was the different views in the different jurisdictions. Partly that's different eating habits, different farming habits, different patterns of demography. If you're dealing with the Highlands, you have a seafood issue, which you don't have in many other parts of England, and so on. Um, All of those issues made it a much more subtle and complex way of assessing risk bringing it together and then learning how to communicate it. And again, I think COVID has shown us that quite a lot of the devolved matters were handled differently in a way that I think surprised Westminster and Whitehall watchers because they get used to thinking that's the centre of the universe. It clearly hasn't been in the last two years. And it certainly wasn't in the early days of the Food Standards Agency. That's a com- compelling account you've just given about you know, what the FSA learned and how it practised science communication and risk communication in terms of you know appreciating the contingency of the science, the fact that you know decisions would be drawing on evidence from different different sources, not just science, and that you know would have to be revised in the light of, of changing understanding. You know, the, the, the difficult question now is, you know, as 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 a collective, as 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 a country, what sort of lessons do you think should be drawn? How should we be developing our kind of the modes of governance um, if, if we expect there to be sort of you know further crises, emergencies, not necessarily pandemics, but, you know, that that will require government to intervene in our lives in in response to a rapidly changing picture. What, what, how should we be learning the lessons of of COVID, drawing on lessons of of previous episodes such as BSE? I think we have to get better at how we communicate risk. I think we have to learn that things have to be in the open and that risk communication involves explaining complicated things in ways that people can understand. But that's not a skill set beyond the combination of people with a social science background like me and people like with Eric with extremely high levels of um, natural science behind them. We have to learn how to do that. But critically, we need to be able to explain decisions and explain trade-offs and treat the public as participants in this discussion. I think we're gonna have to do it about progress to net zero. I think there is no way we can as a country progress on that by just either hiding behind absolutist views of science or terrifying people. And I fear that another pathogen, unless we stop and think about how we communicate, how we understand and critically how we plan for it, Um, There was disaster planning, disaster recovery and pandemic planning for decades to my certain knowledge. And we didn't seem to have it in place at the moment when we needed it most. So I think there's a suite of things and I'm not nostalgic. I think what's changed, what's completely different from the early um, 90s and the 2000s is our use of data and our use of communication. We have tools and skills that we could not dream of at the point of BSC, at the point of Salmonella, at the point of Sudan Red. That data needs to be held, anonymised and used by governments in ways that build public policy and build public trust, because we have got tools that we certainly didn't have 20 years ago.
my sense is there's it's not a lack of knowledge you know there is a lot of knowledge out there in the world about how to communicate risk about how to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty so what's missing is not that there is not this knowledge out there it surely it's something about the sort of the institutions and the governance that that seems to make it hard sometimes for bringing this knowledge to bear in in the moment i mean is is it a is it a constitutional question is it a sort of governance in, institutional question or what what do you think julia i think it's an institutional question i think organizational memory is clearly a very fragile thing and we lose it at our peril i don't think we've been good at passing things on and i think a culture of rapid change, organisational transformation, which Lord knows we've lived through quite a few of those, can happen in ways that protect the knowledge and bring forward learning and keep some principles in place. But a public interest regulator is different from an economic regulator and needs to have a suite of measures which they openly use to to demonstrate how close they can become to the public interest and how they can pass on knowledge through different administrations. And one reason I'll return to the early discussion with Eric that I think Food Standards Agency could have done that better is that the lack of that very fast handbrake turn we so often have in elections should not have affected them so acutely. Now, as it happens in 2010, very dramatic changes were made to institutional architecture, which I don't think necessarily respected the past, but that's what you have when you have a very fast change of government and an economic crisis of unprecedented proportions. So where does this sort of continuity and knowledge come from? Are you saying that there's a a particular kind of group of public interest regulators and that we should sort of collectively kind of cherish and support them to develop and maintain their knowledge and understanding? Or concretely, what do you think would be the way forward? You can never protect any institution from change, but you can make the nature of that change clearer. And I don't think we have a language to talk about public interest regulation. Most regulation in the public discourse is always about economic regulation, which by definition can happen in five year capital programmes. That's what you do if you're in off gem or off what. Um, That's very different from building public trust, which is long term, requires different metrics, different measures. um, And I think can be passed on, can be protected, um, but it has to be done by that being your open commitment. Now, the risk with all of this is it can sound nostalgic and say there was a perfect time. There was never a perfect time. These things are always hugely complicated and we make mistakes as we go along. But keeping it open, keeping it shared, keeping it um, as a live discourse doesn't seem to me to be on the wit of people who have so much of the technology and data at their disposal. Yeah. Eric, um, any, any sort of concluding thoughts? Because I think that's taken us to quite a, an interesting view of... of- what we should be cherishing and supporting in terms of what learning comes from the COVID inquiry? Well, I entirely agree with Julia, but I do remember, because I participated actively in them, that in the early days of the Food Standards Agency, there was a a routine consultation uh, with civil society groups and as well consumer consultation a series of consumer consultation meetings, but they did stop quite abruptly after a few years with no explanation and no account. And the person who convened them and served as the conduit between the agency and civil society uh, ceased to be employed in the agency and, and that was never explained and never justified. And I agree with Julia about institutional memory The problem in BSE was that instead of having evidence-based policy, we had policy-based evidence selection. And the FSA was set up to try to create genuine evidence-based policy. But over the years, it has atrophied in the FSA. But also in other parts of government, we still have policy-based selection of of experts who will say what ministers want to hear and that cite the evidence that supports the policy decisions they have already taken. With so-called arm's length agencies that are fully integrated into government policy making um, and decision making structures, ministers have a wide range of different instruments and mechanisms through which they can ensure that agencies will provide them with 
the advice that they've already decided they want to receive. And if we're going to break that, we have to increase the transparency about not just about the operation of arm's length agencies, but about the interactions between arm's length agencies, whether it's the Food Standards Agency or the Environment Agency and other government departments, because those communications need to be transparent as well. Julia, just a final question is, after you left the Food Standards Agency, your, your career has largely been thinking about civil society and the role of civil society. I mean, do you see a role for civil society to be more organised in developing the sort of idea of, of public interest regulation and, and supporting that memory and, and learning within public interest regulation? I think civil society, whether it's in the form of particular interest groups and lobby groups, whether it's the representatives of the parents of children who died of BSE, are incredibly important voices to have around the table. And we tried to do that when I was at the FSA. But those voices also need cherishing. If they get dismissed by ministers as just the usual suspects or just lobbyists, we are missing the point, which is that public trust in the 21st century is finely layered and requires continual feeding and connection. And the huge, the strong web network of contacts and people who are working together through civil society has served us well through COVID, even to the absolute surprise of people in government. And that goes all the way from mutual aid organisations who were taking food parcels to people and those who raised the alarm about cancer patients who weren't getting their treatment. Those angry voices are just as important as the supportive solidaristic ones. I think civil society has to be at the table in any regulation, but not running it because regulation has to hold in place science, emerging science and views, as well as those views from civil society. Thank you both for joining for what I think is a fascinating and important conversation, and certainly one that I think we will want to return to. Um, Julia, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed it. And Eric, you know, who I have to credit with starting me off on this road. So when I finished studying chemistry a long time ago and thought that I wanted to do something to do with policy and politics, I met Eric at the University of Sussex, who selected me to join the master's programme at SPRU. And I've never looked back. So, Eric, it's nice to see you again. And thank you for this conversation. Well, thank you, Rob. It was a great pleasure having you on our master's programme. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to participate in this event. This series on science advice and government is brought to you in partnership with Expertise Under Pressure, part of the Centre for Humanities and Social Change at Cambridge. To hear more conversations like this, make sure to follow and subscribe on your podcast provider. You can also follow us on Twitter at CSIPOL. If you'd like to send feedback, which we'd love, or have ideas for future episodes, please email us at inquiries at csap.cam.ac.uk. Thanks to our producer, Jessica Foster, and researcher, Nick Kostick, and to you for listening. Music